Thank you, Kumar, for being here. Um, so let's go ahead and call the meeting at 6.31 p.m. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and do roll call. All right. So let's see. Let me start with, I'll start with our chair and vice chair, Jessica Harris. Here. Uh, Ernest. Here. And then I'll go, let's see here. Mary. Present. Okay. Jeanette. Here. And Wolfgang. Here. Andy. Here. And Lindell. Here. And this would be to be his last meeting, but I think um, she has had to move on. So I don't think we're expecting her tonight. Thank you for your service. Um, so we have to recite awkwardly our mission. <laughs> um, you guys ready? Okay. Um, act as a strong, strong, strong advocate. advocate. Justice, 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 equal opportunity, equal opportunity providing, 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 providing civil rights, guidance, and civil rights. I love it. I love the awkwardness. Okay, so we will open um, just shortly to the matters of the public. I just want to read that the commission welcomes comments and questions and commits to listening carefully and thoughtfully to what is presented. A maximum of six public comment time slots are available per meeting. Each speaker will have three minutes to speak. The, commi the commission requests that members of the public refrain from engaging in personal attacks against commissioners and staff members and ask that comments and questions focus on matters related to human rights within the city. Do we have any one here from the public that would like to speak now? Yes, so we, we have, have one. One, I will give uh, Richard. Richard permission to speak. You have the floor. Hey y'all, thank you uh, for having me and uh, allowing me to speak here. Appreciate y'all's work um, here in our city. Um, I've, uh, I live in the Prospect community. I've been working in a nonprofit there for a number of years. And um, I've recently had a couple guys who I've worked with uh, um, four or five years ago who've been incarcerated. And I've been uh, trying to connect and communicate with them um, during this time. And uh, it's been difficult with the pandemic and then I've uh but I've also found during this time that they uh they are spending like very unhealthy amounts of time in their cells and um they get very little to no time out of their cells each day very little human contact um it they they um it sounds very unhealthy and um there's no religious activities. There's no extracurricular activities that they're able to participate in now. And, um, and I would just really appreciate if y'all could look into that um, and see what can be done to loosen restrictions, um, especially now they have vaccines and masks and all these things to allow them to have human uh, contact. Um, because uh, I'm, I'm very concerned for their mental health and well-being, and and it, it just sounds unethical the ways that they're being treated. So I just want to put that before you all. appreciate uh, you all taking time to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Anyone else? Todd, do you see anyone else? No other hands are raised at the moment. Okay, so we'll move on to a commissioner's response to, the, to Richard. I'd just like to thank Richard for bringing this forward. Um, seems like an important thing for us to think about and look into. Thank you. Um, it wasn't clear to me if we knew where those individuals were incarcerated. And I, I, I assume, I don't, I don't know if we can ask Richard to just share that with us and, and give him, you know, a few more seconds just to, to let, it's hard to look into something if, if we don't have that information. His hand is raised again. Todd, okay. can you give him? Yep, I'll, I'll go ahead and give him the floor again. Hey, yes, sorry guys. Uh, the the Albemarle Charlottesville Regional Jail. Um, so the one, the one here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll just also say, yeah, thank you, Richard, for bringing this to our attention. Um, maybe we can address some of that today. I also want to say we are the um, um, we are purview within the city of Charlottesville. So I'm not actually sure how much purview we have, though we have written a, a, a letter. And so we're hoping to address some of that um, today. So we'll move to next agenda items. Um, approving of minutes from 120, our first meeting of this year. Todd, we have to do a, a roll call. We'll do. Uh, Jessica. I'm gonna abstain. Okay. Uh, Ernest. Do we need to check to make sure we have any revisions or if they need to be updated? Oh, sorry. Before we do that? I, sorry, I jumped the gun. I'm really nervous. <laughs> Are there any revisions, Ernest? <laughs> You're doing great, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you. You're fine. I just want to make sure because I, I knew that was something that we, that uh, Todd sent out, but I think that was all on some of those things that we wanted to touch on tonight. But I don't think there are any really any real revisions. Is that right, Todd? In the minutes, that that would be up to you. If you guys saw anything that you thought needed correcting, just let me know, and we'll make sure it happens. I didn't. I didn't think so, but I just want more. I want to check with with you and the other uh, commissioners to make sure. Speak now, forever hold your peace. Okay, no edits. Can we get approval of minutes? Again, I'm abstaining. Okay, Thank, thanks for bringing that up, Ernest. Um, and, and Jessica's abstaining, so Ernest? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, I think I went out of order slightly in roll call. Jeanette? I approve. Okay, uh, Mary? Yes. Let's see, uh, Wolfgang? Yes. Andy? Yes. Lindell? Yes. And Catherine hasn't joined us, is that correct? Don't see her here. Okay. All right. Minutes pass. Yay. Okay. Next item. Try to move those open chair updates um that's me um so i think the biggest update is i'm really excited to have this conversation today and um counselor mcgill is i'm sorry mcgill is here sorry counselor Payne is willing to meet with ernest and i to talk about um the upcoming um panel discussion that we have. So I would hoping maybe later at the end of the meeting, we can talk about um, any things you guys wanna draw to our attention before we have that meeting on, on Friday. I have no other updates. I, um, I, we will be talking about it here about the upcoming town hall and then like the retreat times. Um, Ernest, Todd and I like met to set those dates. So please put that on your um, calendars and I'll be reaching out soon about what that will look like. We have it so late in the year because we're, it's an odd time of commissioners coming on and coming off. And then I'm sorry, Todd, I wanted to announce the new commissioner that we do have that's going to be coming on. Can you please, I, I don't have that in front of me. Can you provide us information on that? Sure. That um, Their name is Erica Robin, Robinson, um, and the term will start on the 1st of March. Um, and uh, doing some outreach to do some presentation in advance of that. Yes, Lindell. Um, is this is this closed now, or are there still opportunities for more um, commissioners to be appointed? It, it's closed now. We actually had to make we made a special request to extend and have a special application right. period um, to fill our our, um, our potential vacancies. And I can say that um, we will have a commission of nine um, on March first. So that's that's very wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments, concerns are out. Go ahead. Yep. Um, I was curious, when is the retreat going to be? It's um, April 23rd. It's on the our meeting notes. I yes, think, Jeanette. I think I saw it. I think it's the 24th, right? Um, or 23rd, but I didn't notice the time. It says it starts at 10. How long does it go? 
how what two, four hours, ten to two? To be determined, I think okay. um, maybe that's a point of discussion this evening. Um, we didn't really get into those details, and maybe we can talk about the content and what you're in, expected in uh, length of time. That's a Saturday. Um, just to, it doesn't yeah, specify yeah. that on the notes there. Yeah. So hopefully we can talk about that. What more of what that can look like. Any other questions? I guess I'm just anxious to like the, the next topic. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Council McGill and um, Colonel Kumar for being on here so last minute and willing to have this conversation. Also, I also wanted to distinguish for the public, again, we did write a letter um, about our concerns um, that were brought up last time for the community public to the ACRJ. And we were purposeful in sending it to the city council. Cause again, that is um, where we are able um, to draw attention to. And I know um, Council McGill is on that board and we're so fortunate to have Kumar here with us. And so um, I wanted to turn over the floor. I don't have questions at the moment, uh, but kind of turn over the floor to, I know there was a meeting that you guys had and if you had a letter or response to our letter, it was long, um, but if you had a response to our letter and the concerns that we brought up. Um, I've only been on the jail board for two meetings. <laughs> um, and so obviously I mentioned to Colonel Coomer that there were these concerns um, and after sending them to him, he volunteered just to come and speak to everybody. So really, I'm just gonna step back and let Colonel Coomer address this, um, but I'm here if you have any other questions or anything for me as well. I, I guess one question now I have is, um, can you help explain maybe to the public and to myself, again, that's not in our purview per se, um, the regional jail, but can you help us give some understanding and context into your role there and, and insights you may be able to have? Um, can you just explain that just for context? I am figuring out my role there. Um, I believe from what I, my understanding is that the board is an oversight board um, right now, the two meetings have been very much about like, the last meeting we had an update from the medical staff as to the level of care that people were getting, the accessibility of medications, how that works. I've also made some requests for some other updates, agenda items um that will be going forward one to explain how the trustee system works um because a lot of this is the actual system of how the jail works is relatively new to me um i've worked with people who have been in the jail before or i have been in some justice committees that compare our jail to other jails but the actual inner workings of our jail and i've be, um, Colonel Coomer and I have also tried to get a time that I could come over and have a tour of the jail and see the conditions, um, but it hasn't been working right yet. And there's, if there is a pandemic, if especially when the COVID numbers were higher, there is no point in bringing somebody else in who could potentially expose somebody who might be sick with something else to somebody who is immune compromised with COVID. Um, so I was not going to do that at that time. And we are working on that to go there. As far as I, like I said, I'm still figuring out exactly what my role is. Um, and actually, Colonel Coomer might have a better idea of what yes. <laughs> um, four so member roles are. That was helpful. I actually learned a lot from that. That was something that we did have in our letter was the quest that someone could put eyes on. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to give I always want to give an overview for those that maybe didn't or are first hearing this letter for the first time. We did send a letter out to uh, Mayor Snook and the members of um, City Council on January 31st. 31st um, and we kind of, we broke it out in different categories. We were concerned about the adequate distribution of cleaning supplies, 
the low vaccination rates for staff, which is 64%, and incarcerated individuals, which is 66%. Um, concerns about ventilation within the facility, lack of transparency regarding ACRJ staff use of preventive controls, and lack of mass use within the facility. And so we requested, um, just for context for everyone, for the city to review this. And we did make a request that if someone was able to um, just put eyes on this. So that's good to, to hear. Lindell, you had your hand raised. Yes, actually, um, before I, this may be a good time to do this. I would really just like to understand the um, the structure in terms of you know putting eyes on something. And when we say, can you please look into this, who has actually any authority to, to push to make change? I mean, is there is there anyone other than Colonel Kumar, for example? I mean, I'm assuming you are in charge, right? Yes, ma'am. If we were to come, and I'm not saying we are, but if we were to come around, if somebody were to say, you know what, this is really not a good idea to have this situation. We really think that, um, you know, um, there should be a push to have vaccination increased among people who work there and people who are incarcerated. Is there anyone who has any authority or power to mandate that? Where, where does that lie? Where does that power lie? Is, is that a question for me or? <clears throat> or Sorry, I, it's a question for anyone who can answer it. <laughs> so yes, I guess with you, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that question. Who can mandate my staff to um, have vaccines? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. So, Councillor McGill, do you know? I, I, I'm really just trying to find out who has power here, right? I mean, if we're asking for things to change or if we're wanting to know what, what can be done, I'd just like to know who has that power. Well, if I could make a, a suggestion, one, this is this is part of that process we're having right here is to discuss some concerns that that you all may have, the community may have. Bring to my attention, we can talk, we can work out, um, I can answer your questions. Um, if somebody from the committee wants to come in and have a tour, I'd be happy to take you on a tour. Um, and we can kind of find out what, what we can do, what we can't do, what resources we need, why we're doing some things we're doing. If we're doing something that... Um, there's a better way to do it. I'm, I'm all ears. I'm happy to work with the community. We've done that very well over my administration the last almost nine years um, until the pandemic. Things seem to have gotten out of out of uh, kilter for some reason. But I'm trying to get things back on track. Um, so this is part of that process that you're talking about. As far as power and authority over the jail, as you all know, there's no one person has all the power. Everybody has a boss. My boss is the Albemarle Marl Shawsville Regional Jail Board Authority, which is made up of all three sheriffs of Nelson County, Albemarle, the city, uh, three executive representatives from all three jurisdictions, um, Steve Walker, excuse me, Steve Carter out of Nelson County, Doug Walker out of the county, and uh, at the moment, Ashley Marshall out of the city. And then there are two at large, um, excuse me, one at large, and then one citizen representative from the city and the county and then the, a member of each of those city councils or the two boards also. So they're the ones who have the authority. Now there are other regulatory agencies as well, the Department of Corrections um, and Department of Criminal Justice Services. They're the two regulatory agencies that also make sure that um, what I'm doing complies with law. Okay, that's very helpful. So just, just to, to clarify, if there were to be a situation in which the, the board were to say something, I'm just making this up because I'm trying to, to figure out where the boundaries of things are. If the board were to say, um, we, want, um, we want more um, access to cleaning supplies for, uh, for the incarcerated folks to, to use, right? Would that have the power of that would have to happen? I'm assuming there'd be a negotiation and you would say, well, here's the constraints. These are why we wouldn't do it. So I understand that. But if that, it, could they conceivably say, okay, we heard everything and yet we think this is important and, and you need to do it. So they have the authority to do that. And yes, do that. Okay. I serve at the pleasure of the board. So I have two choices when the board directs me to do something, I either resign my position or do as they ask. Okay. So thank absolutely. You. Okay, thank you. That was very helpful.
Um, it's good. I think um, it's always important. I think what we often face in the public is that they're, you know, we're able to bring up concerns and at the same time, we're at the mercy of those that are empowered to make that happen. Wolfgang. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, I thought it'd be helpful to ask, uh, what is the status of COVID currently at ACRJ and what have what has been your response to the policies that we've either suggested or just inquired about? Sure. So as of today, when I left, I think we had 17 cases of active COVID as we speak. We had not had a positive case in the last three days, despite our testing. However, this evening, we did have one person who tested positive. So our streak has ended, uh, but we did hit our peak, I believe, three, three and a half weeks ago, and we've been declining ever since. And I say this quite often that we represent the community in many ways. As you see COVID rise in the community, you'll see it rise within the jail. As you see it taper off in the community, you'll see it taper off in the jail. We, we are identical. Our numbers, if you put them on a you know, chart, you would see the rise and fall. You almost couldn't tell which one was which. So as you can see in the county, the numbers are starting to decline. Our numbers are starting to decline. So I, I think we're, we're on our way out, um, but we're still keeping our restrictions in place. Uh, I do know there's been a lot of concerns about cleaning supplies. And a, a couple things real quick about that. We issue cleaning supplies twice a day. And the cleaning supplies we issue are called Liminex. That's the chemical that's been recommended by the uh, EPA and CDC to kill the COVID virus. It's used in nursing homes and hospitals. And you have to remember there's certain chemicals you can't use in an occupied area because of the noxious fumes or the corrosive chemicals and so forth. So you have to be careful what you put in there. The problem is it's called Liminex and it's blue. So if you, if you saw that in a bottle, what are you gonna think it actually is? And it's called Liminex. A lot of people think it's Windex. So we get complaints to, the, complaints to the community that all they're giving us to clean with is Windex. And we constantly remind our individuals that it is actually the Liminex and it's designed to kill and clean the COVID virus and also mold and bacteria and so forth. Now we put those in twice a day, like I said, at each shift change in the morning and then later in the evening. A lot of people have um, also asked about hand sanitizer. And we don't provide hand sanitizer to anyone except our staff. And there's two reasons for that. One, the CDC recommends the best way is to use soap and water to wash your hands during the COVID. Far and away the best way. The only time you want to use uh, hand sanitizer is if you don't have access to soap and water. So the other reason is if we provide hand sanitizer, it must be 60% alcohol based in order to be effective against COVID. The problem is statistics show about 70% of my population has substance abuse issues. So if I give someone, here's 60% by volume alcohol, there's a high likelihood that it'll be abused and possibly cause someone to become very ill. So I'm not gonna provide something that one is the second best treatment to clean your hands when I have the best way to do it, which is soap and water, which everyone has access to 24 hours a day. My staff, however, do not have access to bathrooms at all times. So they, they must frequently wash their hands or cleanse their hands. So they do have alcohol um, sanitizer at their post to wash their hands frequently. Much like the type that you see in hospitals when they come out of your patient's room, they hit that button a couple of times and rinse their hands real quick. That's what we have kind of around the facility for our staff. The other thing is we can't leave cleaning supplies inside of a housing unit. Department of Corrections standards state you can't leave them in there for fear of abuse. An individual could take cleaning supplies, splash them in somebody else's face, an officer's face. Um, and if you use too much of a cleaning supply, it's even in your own house, the fumes can become noxious if there are too many of a particular cleaning supply. So you don't want to leave them in there. Two, think of it this way. Think of your um, housing area. Um, about the size of a, of a large um, living room or a large master bedroom, okay? And you have 12 people in there, 12, 12 bunks, a, a shower, and, um, and a toilet. You can clean all day long, but because the virus is spread by the air primarily, I mean, it is spread on surfaces, but more so through the air, you can clean everything that you, all day long, constantly nonstop cleaning. The virus is in the air. So the constant cleaning that you could do would, would do nothing essential to limit the spread of the virus. 
It's not as effective. Unless people just stop breathing, then certainly. So what people confuse is a lot, the way you want to clean a room is, or when you want to clean a room is, if you go in to use a uh, visitation booth and that person leaves, you then want to go in and sanitize that room and let it sit for a few minutes and bring the next person in. That's to keep the virus from, from transmitting from one person to another. But if everyone's in that same living room or bedroom 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that virus is going to be transmitted no matter what you do. So that's, that, that's where it comes down to the cleaning supply issue. One, we can't provide it 24 seven, so we do provide it twice a day. Um, but three, it's not as effective as it would be, say in your, um, like I said, in a room, a, a doctor's room where somebody goes in, they leave, the nurse cleans it, sanitizes it so the transmission is not there for the next person. Um, I'm trying to think of some other issues that people had. Oh, masks, uh, we do provide all inmates with two masks. But again, if you got that bedroom type scenario, living room type scenario, Unless you sleep with that mask on your face, the minute you take it off, you have now spread, if you have the virus, you've now spread that virus into that bedroom or to that large living room. So most of our inmates don't wear their mask 24 seven. Most of them don't wear them at all. Now, if they come out into the hallway, we do require that they wear their mask as they move throughout the facility. Um, staff, staff are required to wear N95 masks anytime that they're within six feet or less of an inmate for any time to go into housing areas. Uh, they're they're requested to keep it on the whole time they're inside the facility. But if, if you've ever put on one of those N95 masks for 12 hours, it will literally bruise your face. Um, it, nurses get it quite often. So it's not very comfortable, but my staff will do it. Uh, someone mentioned vaccine rates. We are inmate population is vaccinated to 64%. The problem I have is I could vaccinate everyone today to 100%, but if 30 of them leave and 30 new unvaccinated people come in, I now have to start the process over. So we maintain a 64% um, rate. I also have new people coming in and people going out. So actually it's a, it's a really good rate if you look at it that way. I don't have a stagnant, stagnant, uh, excuse me, stagnant population. My staff is around 63%. We do offer a uh, $150 incentive once you get your second dose. We offer another $150 bonus if you get boosted. And our inmates, uh, when they come in, we immediately ask them if they're vaccinated. If not, uh, we offer a vaccine right then and there. Uh, and we also check vaccination, too. So we can't just come in and say they're vaccinated. We're not going to take the word for it. We actually go in and, and check. Um, in order to encourage people to become vaccinated, we have these canteen bags. It's chips and candy bars and um, lots of really, I hate to say it, unhealthy stuff. But it works. The guys like it. So we have a really big bag. So when you get your first shot, you get a bag of canteen. Second shot, another bag of canteen. Booster, another bag of canteen. We've had guys not get their shot because we ran out of the bags. They said, come back and get me when you got more bags. So we try and keep many on hand. So we try and encourage people to get vaccinated. So I think we're doing a really good job there. We have some people, some of our inmate population just flat out refuse to get vaccinated. And we have an individual who has some comorbid medical concerns and he will not get vaccinated. So we try and keep him segregated from the rest of the population. So uh, to keep him as safe as we possibly can, but um, there's no guarantees. And even if you are vaccinated, there's still no guarantees. I know we all know that you can still um, transmit the virus and contract the virus. We've had staff who were fully vaccinated and boosted and still um, got the virus. So now granted, they weren't as sick as some others. Um, and I am pro-vaccine. A lot of people ask me that too. My entire family is vaccinated. Um, and I, I recommend to everyone to get vaccinated. Um, I, I see the hands, Ernest and Andy. I just, um, I wanted to ask about um, preventative measures, something we mentioned a lot. So um, we were really proactive in putting in like CDC guidelines, what they have guidelines for um, incarcerated spaces. So can you please help me understand the preventative protocols that come in? And then you mentioned earlier that you couldn't ask for mandate for your staff to be vaccinated. vaccinated. Um, why is that? And I hear what you're saying that, that it seems you have a consistent 64% of being able to be tested. What are, what are the, so you mentioned the limits of people just refusing the vaccinations and you mentioned like the supply. So what also is holding up that higher rate. I mean, just 64 seems really low. Sure. Me. I work at UVA and we have like 99.9% .9 of our students who um, were vaccinated. So you can just help please answer that. And then I do Andy and Ernest afterwards, if, if uh, we see, I see you, so. Sure, well, I'll say supply is not an issue. 
Supply is not an issue. We get our vaccines directly from the state and some from the health department too. So we have plenty of vaccines. Uh, we hold a vaccine clinic every Thursday. We've actually hired two UVA nursing students who come in and help us with our vaccine clinic every Thursday. And if someone wants one sooner and they're gonna be released, we can accommodate that too. So we will stop what we're doing to give anyone who wants a vaccine a vaccine. So our inmate population is 64%. That's, I cannot compel them. I, I think we all, all agree, I cannot hold someone down and force them to take a, a vaccine. I also cannot withhold privileges or rights from them until they comply with the vaccine. So we do the best we can to encourage them. My staff, I have staff who will never get vaccinated. It's the same way in the community. Um, there are people who just won't. There, I know nurses who will not get vaccinated, a doctor who won't get vaccinated. Um, there are some teachers, law enforcement, lawyers, every, every occupation, those individuals who will not get vaccinated no matter what you do. Um, and quite so frankly- With the preventative parts, like what is the preventative procedures like from screening when they're like new people are coming to in this space if someone is um, someone is tested positive for COVID, can you run us yeah. through those protocols? Sure, absolutely. So every person comes in, when it comes into our intake facility, they're immediately screened for COVID. They're asked the questions, temps taken, uh, symptoms checked, um, and then we test. Everyone who comes in is tested. Well, let's get the test back. If they're negative, they'll go to a, another holding area and they'll eventually go to a quarantine unit for 14 days. If they test positive at that time, they're immediately put in quarantine. So if the person tests negative, they go to a quarantine block for 14 days, and they'll be housed with anyone else who came with them that day. So we put about two people in a cell for 14 days. They are monitored through that time, and they're tested through that time. And as long as they stay negative, and they test negative on that 14th day, they're then placed in general population. If at any time someone tests positive, either in the general population or in a quarantine area, they too are moved to another section of the jail with other individuals who are also positive. Did I answer your question? It did. Andy, I saw your hand first, then Ernest and Wendell. Sure. So, um, uh, so the uh, one question is, uh, you know, what have you done in terms of uh, getting people uh, out on electronic monitoring and other ways to reduce the population? What are sort of the numbers there? Great, great question. And I'd love to, to talk about this. Um, home electronic incarcerations is probably the number one way we get individuals out of the jail as, as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. Uh, before the pandemic on March 1st of, of 2020, uh, I think we have about two or three people in home electronic incarceration. Within about 60 days, we had the largest home electronic incarceration program in the state of Virginia, both in percentage of population and in terms of raw numbers of individuals on the program. So our staff really ramped up our program. At one time, we had 85 people out there on the program out of a jail population at that time of around 360. Um, we now, as of today, we have, when I left, we have 59 people in home electronic incarceration. We had 294 people inside of the facility. Um, and we constantly screen the, the population to make sure that everyone who is eligible to be out on home electronic incarceration is actually on the program. We also use home electronic incarceration pretrial. So individuals who uh, may not be allowed out on bond but with the additional monitoring afforded by home electronic incarceration, it gives the courts and the common attorneys a little more confidence that the person will come back to court. So we have more people out on pretrial than we otherwise would because of the home electronic incarceration. We also, uh, my medical staff review our population. So if somebody comes in and they have some significant health issues that if, if they contracted the virus, they may experience greater complications than somebody else, they will immediately alert me. I will work with the courts to see if we can put that person out home electronic incarceration. Some of the problems um, are that some individuals, their, their um, sentences or the crimes that they've committed or crimes they're charged with prevent them from going into the program. Do you, but, do you have any specifics on what those limitations are? I do. I mean, you're, it's your, what you're on, like we're thinking of right now, murder, mm -hmm. uh, rape, robbery, um, a lot of domestic violence, malicious wounding, and lawful wounding. Um, and that, those are pretty much it, but there's a few other ones that kind of come off that, but yeah, that's about it. 
Um, and then there's another question I had about um, are, are the are the rates any different for the uh, women's side of the jail uh, than the, the men's side of the jail? Have, have the numbers you've been giving been the general, like all the population, or is there any differences in, in how things have been in the uh, women's side of the jail? Anecdotally, I, I don't believe so. I haven't seen any numbers in, in any way. I mean, it may, if a cell block or housing area full of men gets infected, well, of course, that would be you know, that day you may see 30 and then a women's cell block that is smaller, um, you might have 10 people infected. So it's the percentage of men to women inside the facility right now is about 10% to 90%, 90% men. Um, but we don't see any vast differences between the um, um, COVID positive rates between the two populations. They just vary from day to day. Okay. So you don't have numbers broken out for the infection rates? separated between those we don't no no okay. if, I, if i had to guess if i had to pick one of the others there are men have higher rates because our the housing areas our men are in or larger so if one person there gets covid is a, a good likelihood that more men will get it as opposed to women who are in relatively smaller uh, housing areas sure andy does it answer all your questions uh i think so for now yeah thank you okay. ernest <laughs> Uh, thanks for being here tonight, Colonel. A couple of things. Um, one, about uh, filtration. So that, that would probably be an issue with not being able to put filtration units out and around because you know, of the mechanics of it and having access to um, being able to tear that down and use it as a weapon or what have you. Because uh, that would probably also help bring your numbers down in those rooms, but you probably can't not put uh, units like that on the floors in those areas. Is that pretty much correct about the filtration side? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, it's a 50 year old building. Um, it certainly wasn't, it doesn't even have any ductwork actually, or very, very minimal ductwork that was done in a, in a renovation a long time ago. But the actual housing areas do not have ductwork to actually duct, you know, air like that. So it's pretty much circulated throughout the building. Um, but that's something we're looking at with our renovation expansion to certainly tackle them. Okay. Um, you talk about your staff, um, you know, and I understand that about, you know, people's choice about um, not being vaccinated and vaccinated. My question is for those that are not vaccinated, are they asked to uh, get tested uh, per week or, or, are they, uh, or do they get tested once they start to feel ill? Uh, but if they've been exposed, they'll be tested. If they are symptomatic, they will be tested. And we ask them each to, to screen for uh, symptoms. Uh, and a person is provided 10 days of leave, not counted against their, their, um, their leave balances. So it encourages individuals not to come to work sick. Um, if, if they have the virus or feeling symptomatic, they are encouraged to stay home. And we do that, like I said, by giving them 10 days away from work for that purpose. Um, but we, the best way to operate is assume everyone you come in contact is positive. When, if a person tests negative on a test, everyone thinks, well, I'm good, I'm, I'm fine. I don't, I don't need to wear my mask like I should. I don't need to practice good hand hygiene, good PPE um, protocols. So we operate under the assumption that every single person, every inmate, every staff member is positive and you should operate accordingly. So that is our answer to the question about preventative like testing. Do you require them to get preventative testing? We do not. We do not do weekly testing. No, we do not. We only test if somebody's asymptomatic or if they are exposed. Yeah, that, that's interesting because, you know, that they would not want to be tested on a regular basis because you know, once you get, I mean, it's, it's almost too late once you're around someone and you don't know. Um, the test that you give inmates when they come in, is that a, a rapid test or, P, or P, a PCR test? It's a rapid test. Rapid test, okay. Um, and then for them to be negative, that's also a rapid test as well? It is, okay. correct. And we, also do P, and we also do uh, P, PCR tests as well. But when they okay. come in, it is a rapid test. Okay, and then you do the PCR test to confirm the rapid test? 
I need to find out exactly when we do the PCR test. I'm sorry, I don't have that with me. I should have brought my nurse practitioner. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for the information about the at home and the monitoring and, and getting people out um, it, it, the best you can with doing the monitoring uh, from home. Um, I think that was all of my questions that I had. So again, thank you for being here tonight, sir. And I'm passing over. You're welcome. I think it's Lindell, Mary, Catherine, and Wolfgang. Lindell. Okay. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to follow up on uh, um, Mr. Firo's um, comment. Um, he mentioned, um, I think I understood, if I understood him correctly, that um, he's reporting that um, some of the incarcerated individuals are not um, allowed access to religious services because of COVID. Have there been changes in that access to, um, uh, to religious services? There, there has, we do not bring churches inside of the facility anymore, but our chaplain and his volunteers and his assistant chaplain are at work every day providing religious services. They're non-denominational. They provide religious material, counseling, um, cell side um, services. So religious services has never stopped. And that that is there anything that you can think of that would that someone might feel that they are not getting the access that they would normally have? Like I'm just trying to understand maybe there are people who are not getting what they need because that's not seen somehow. I mean, are you aware of anything? Probably. Like I said, we used to have church services inside. We'd have a, a church, and I, it's been two years, I can't remember their name, but they're fantastic. We'd come in, bring all their instruments and stuff, and they would actually have a full-on church service inside of the jail. And individuals would sign up for it, and it would go, go to the actual church service. That's probably what the individuals are referring to when they don't have religious services. But as far as access to religious materials or religious personnel, like I said, non-denominational religious personnel, we do have uh, two paid staff. They're actually paid by another organization, not me, and five um, volunteers as well who come and provide cell side services. So if somebody needs something not get it, they can contact our chaplain. And we can certainly have a conversation about that. And, and Richard, uh, I don't know if you're still on there or not, but I'm happy to give him my cell phone right now. If you want to give me a call, I'm happy to discuss uh, some of your concerns in greater detail if you don't feel comfortable providing that information now. Thank you. To follow up to Lindell and to ask, I'm sorry, I, I do want to get the other people, but in it is concerning about the mental health, just the isolation in general, the psyche that it is. To be, can you address that? How how you're providing support for mental health care per Richard's question, and he is he is still on. So okay, um, well, it, I don't know what to say to that. To be honest. Um, yes, it is tough. It is tough on all of our inmates. Our average length of stay for men is about 60 days. Our average length of stay for women is about 34 days. Last time we did the study, um, we do one of the biggest ways we try and combat the, the loneliness, the, you know, potential de despair that anyone would feel at any time in jail or prison, let alone COVID, um, is the, through our tablet system. So all of our inmates will have a tablet. Uh, if you have, are aware of this or not, everybody has a tablet about the size of an iPad. Uh, they can do um, visitation on there, virtual visitation. There are music, books, movies, games. Some of those are you pay for, and there are also free options as well. Um, it's also a phone. So everyone has been given essentially a telephone, a computer, and a uh, visitation device. And they're available from about 8 a.m. to about 10, 11 o'clock at night. So that's one of the ways we try and maintain contact with family and friends during this time and also combat boredom, um, despair, and mental health uh, concerns as well. We do have a full mental health team. And if someone has some mental health issues, we can certainly um, see them and provide services as possible. I'm sorry, I keep asking questions, but it's related no. to what you're saying. Is and I promise, Catherine I, and 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 um, Mary, I see you. Um, the educator in me is kicking off. So, like, I hear you saying a lot. I'd love if you could summarize this and send it to us. It'd be great if that's not too inundating for you. How much? There's a difference of like what's available and what inmates actually think or may know. So, I, I hear what you're saying is available to them. Do you know that 
that they're 100% aware of all of the things that you're saying that they have access to? Well, when they come in, they're handed the tablet by one staff member to them and they're kind of explained how to do it and given their access codes to it. And then it's, it's very self-explanatory. So they know they have that. Um, the chaplain goes around the facility. So someone, or, and also his um, other individuals, so they see them. Um, they also have their handbook that details um, mental health services available. Um, they're also staff that are in and out of those cell blocks twice per hour, every cell block. Every inmate is visually seen by a staff member every twice per hour. So if anyone had any questions, any concerns, any problems, they have at least two opportunities per hour or more um, to raise those concerns or questions with staff members. So um, although, no, I, I wouldn't know if every single person knows all that I just told you, but I can't imagine they, they wouldn't. And that the other inmates there who've been there for quite some time or, or who've been in and out of the facility several times would withhold information and not tell them as well. So there's plenty of information out there, plenty of ways to find out what's going on. We also are proactive in providing that information. Um, so I think a lot of times, that's what I like to talk to people when they, they bring concerns like that, they're kind of um, overarching, kind of vague. So when I really drill down, then it helps me kind of understand exactly what they're talking about. Just like you said, I really don't know what that person means when they say no religious services. Do they mean they missed going to that church service? And, and I, I get that. Or are they saying that I have asked for religious services and I've been denied? That's a different story. So I, that's why I really like to talk to people and kind of get down to the details to find out what's going on. Catherine, I think I saw you first and Mary. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the home electronic um, monitoring and, and maybe you said this and I missed it, but um, are you charging people now for that? Individuals who can afford to pay, and we let them determine that, by the way, uh, we don't have a means test. So the vast majority of people do not pay. But we are now having people who are beginning to work and who do pay for the service. We charge $4 per day. The fee that we are charged from the monitoring company is $3.50 per day. Now, and I'll, I'll say this, before the pandemic, it was $13 per day. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the state of Virginia, code of Virginia, required the superintendents and sheriffs charge a fee for the home electronic incarceration service. When COVID, when we started using the program and um, really using the program in March of 2020, when the pandemic hit, I immediately waived all fees, all fees. No one had to pay. Whether they could afford to or not, it didn't matter. No one had to pay. We did not want a fee to be a a barrier to someone being released to the program. Same with pretrial HEI. The individual is not required to pay. So it's not a, a cash bond system. They're, they were not charged. We just recently started charging the last few months when the economy started picking up and guys were, were working and were able to pay. And again, I want to say, we ask them, are you able to afford $4 per day? And if they say yes, we charge them. If they say no, we don't go into it. We don't dig. We don't look. I take your word for it. And, and so the, the waiving the fees was a pandemic thing, and now you've started charging a relatively modest amount to certain people. Is, there, is this going to sunset at some point? We're going to go back to the $13, $15 a day, or is, is this going to be durable? Uh, well, uh, this is what happened. So as I mentioned, the Code of Virginia required the superintendents and sheriffs charge a fee, okay? Mm -hmm. And that didn't change to about July 1 of 2020. Um, so when I waived that fee, I didn't necessarily have the authority to do so, but we felt it was the right thing to do. So we worked with Delegate um, Sally Hudson mm -hmm. to change the law. So I wasn't flouting the law anymore. Right. So she did a fantastic job and was able to get a, a, uh, a bill passed that amended the law that gave superintendents and sheriffs the option of charging for fees. So... I say that because we worked very hard to ensure that not only do we not have to charge fees we didn't want to, I wanted to make sure other superintendents and sheriffs had the same opportunity. They weren't compelled to do it anymore. So we went through all that hard work because I don't want to choose, or to, excuse me, to charge fees for home electronic incarceration, at least not what we work $13 per day. I, I don't feel as though it's a lot to ask someone who is working and truly can afford to pay at least a pay for the, the service that is provided. No more, just what it costs taxpayers. That's it. 
The extra fifty percent, the extra fifty cents per day, actually goes towards their um, drug test, drug and alcohol test. So you plan for this to be in perpetuity, like that? Correct. As long as I'm superintendent, as long as the board has no objections, I will not charge on the charge incarceration fees. Thank you. Okay, like, let me back up again, except in places where people can't afford to pay um, and they want to charge the $4 per day, the, the fee that we're actually charged by the um, tracking company. Mary? Yeah, I want to go back to the vaccination rates of your staff. And, and I guess I'm, I'm curious about whether, you know, more than a third of the staff is unvaccinated and it's your view that you are not permitted to require mm -hmm. vaccination or is it that your view that you don't choose to require vaccination well and honestly i'm not sure given the changes here recently if i if i can't honestly require staff to become vaccinated uh, the university of virginia stopped their mandatory vaccine program um so we have not revisited it after the um, supreme court ruling so now that being said i would be reluctant um i guess if i had to i would but i'd be reluctant to do so um we would lose many fine staff um, because of a max vaccine mandate, just like the University of Virginia Health System lost staff who refused to get vaccinated. They would choose to work someplace else. I would be in that same boat. But they did that because they were prioritizing care for the individuals for whom they had a responsibility. I mean, you too have that responsibility, maybe even more, more uh, acutely, given that people can't choose to access health care anywhere but your facility. And yet, you haven't contemplated imposing a vaccination requirement upon your well, I've, I've contemplated it. I have, and I've talked to other sheriffs and other superintendents around the state, and their view is similar to mine, that if, once you start doing that and you start losing staff, um, you have to weigh the, the pros and cons there. So right now I, I'm down 30 officers, 30. Um, I'm at bare minimum staffing as we speak. If I lose any more staff, COVID won't be my biggest concern anymore. The safety and security of the inmates who are currently there would be my biggest security, my biggest concern. So that I am, I again, I am pro-vaccine. I encourage all my staff. When we had our vaccine, first vaccine clinic at the jail, I was the first one in the chair in front of my staff to show them that I was in it too. I was the first one in the county to offer a um, incentive to get vaccinated. I am all for it, but, but again, I have to weigh the pros and cons of um, requiring vaccines. We do our vaccines on site, so I remove all the barriers. All right, it's free, just, it's on site, on their time, and I'll pay to do it. But I, but, all right, not, not to belabor this, but just like one additional question, which is that I assume that individuals who do not want to be exposed to unvaccinated people don't have a choice to avoid unvaccinated staff or or is that wrong no that is correct that's correct vaccine unvaccinated staff work all over the facility and my staff also don't have the opportunity not to be around unvaccinated inmates either they, so they have to work with each other and and they do so i have plenty of inmates who refuse to become vaccinated and i can't segregate them from and and only put them around vaccinated staff so it's it's, it's on both sides. And again, I know that that is not a satisfactory answer. Um, it is one of those answers where you gotta kind of walk that line of being realistic and look at your resources and do the best you can with the information resources you have at the time. That's what we're doing. Thank you. Yeah, that's not satisfactory, but I wanna just amplify what Mary said too. It's, it's frustrating to kind of hear that uncertainty on your end. Um, are there any other questions? And I want to be conscious of uh, Councillor Miguel's time. I know she's limited. And um, Colonel Kumar, I want to ask you: Are you allowed? Are you able and willing to stay until the end? Because we won't have public comment to the end. And I know Richard asked questions, and others may have, have have questions afterwards. Are you willing to stay to the end of the until the end, where we can ask public comment? Sure. What what time would that be? Do you know? I can't know. It just been, I don't think we have a lot to, to discuss. This was like the, 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 the main meet. Um, so I would say maybe the next 30 minutes or so being optimistic. Yeah, I can do 30 minutes. Sure, sure. Okay. Are there other commissioners that have questions, comments, things they want to bring up? I 
I had yes. a quick question. Um, I was just wondering, you said that you were down on staff. Is that, I mean, that was sounded like a pretty significant number. Is that since COVID or do you know, like, is that a typical trend? It's, it's since COVID. We were, you know, for all intent purposes, um, relatively full staff prior to COVID. Uh, we've had individuals who have significant medical, medical and health issue concerns. They retired early or they got out of corrections in general um, for their own safety. Uh, we've had individuals who uh, just kind of reached their breaking point, their stress point. Um, it is stressful for them as well to be in that environment. Uh, they've taken COVID home to their families who have been hospitalized. Uh, they too are, are stressed. Um, so yeah, we've, and we're not getting the amount of um, applications we normally would. People don't want to come work in an environment with COVID. Um, so, and then there's a perception in the, the public now with all law enforcement and criminal justice agencies that um, we're just not appreciated like we used to be. And people are um, getting out as soon as they can and they're not coming in. anymore. So it's not just my facility. It's all around the state of Virginia and across the country. Police departments, jails, prisons, we're all suffering. Thank you. Sure. Any other final thoughts? So Colonel Kumar, I really appreciate you being here. I'd love if, if we could exchange, um, you have my email, but uh, maybe contact information. I'd like to volunteer to come when it's available and safe to, to view. I know that was a per request from um, one of our public comment. And so I wanna volunteer. So let me know the procedures um, for that. Thank you again for this time. Uh, Council McGill, did you have anything else you would like to say? Um, only if you have any questions for me specifically. Um, like I said, I am figuring out what my role is on this board, but I am also listening to people and bringing forward questions and also using my, my, my newness to ask for information because I don't know it yet. And the board has been putting on the agenda to bring forward the information. Like I said, things like how the trustee system works, um, what we can do about various things. And um, so I'm always willing to be that conduit if someone doesn't feel comfortable talking to Colonel Coomer one-on-one -on -one, um, or for any reason wants to be anonymous because if they have family or anything and they're afraid that there might be, I mean, there's all sorts of, there's people have fears about all sorts of reasons. Um, and if there's any a point either to um, Colonel Coomer himself or to the board in general, I'm always willing to be that avenue. So, um, and I'm, I'm really pretty easy to find and contact. Um, emails always the best way to get in touch with me. And I've been trying, while well, I was here early, I was trying to answer as many emails about the tax rate increase issue as possible, so. Well, I really appreciate that availability in um, the, uh, Colonel Kamar. I appreciate your openness and even willing to offer um, to Richard that I think just transparency is really important in this. And so I'm, I'm interested in at the end, you know, for public comment, you know, any questions that they may have, but I appreciate the transparency and willing to have this conversation. Um, and I will definitely be following up. Excellent. I also yeah. want to point out that after someone brought this forward in January, the jail on the website now does have an up-to-date um, count of both active COVID cases, diagnosed COVID cases, and there's a third metric. It's new cases are red, current cases are blue, and green are individuals who are no longer considered contagious, so they've been cleared. And it's in a bar graph form, so you can kind of see the, the cycle of the current outbreak. Um, so we are trying to make more and more transparency. Sometimes people don't realize something isn't transparent if they're in it all the time and they don't realize that it's hard information for others to access. So any transparency issues, please bring them forward. Um, so thank you very much. And if nobody else has any questions, I'm going to go check on my kid. Yes, please take care of them. Thank you again for coming tonight. If there's any questions that come out of public comments, we'll, we'll direct them to you.
Excellent. Thank you so much. Shoot me an email. I appreciate it. I will. I will. Thank you so much for coming. Okay. Um, so let's see if I can hold to this promise of 30 minutes. Um, Todd, staff, reporting update. I'll try to help you keep your promise and be very brief. Um, you'll find my my report attached in the in the agenda packet. So if you, as always, if you have questions about anything in that report, feel free to reach out to me at any point and be happy to talk to you about what's in there. Um, just a couple of things that aren't in that report, um, just to give you some some updates on what's happening um, with regard to the resident concerns uh, from folks at, living at Midway Manor. We've been doing some additional follow up outreach over there. Um, Mary actually joined me one of the evenings. Thank you, Mary. Um, and we did a lot of door-to-door -door outreach, just checking in um, with people who either attended the meeting back in November to, to share their concerns or people who had previously signed one of the petitions that we had helped draft and send to, um, to the management uh, outlining some of the concerns. Um, I think we, we had about 26 doors over the two days that we were doing outreach. Um, and I, we're, we're doing another uh, sign-on letter for requesting a meeting with uh, the ownership because that's something that's been a recurring question and request. Um, I think we have nine, nine signatures on that out of the 26 people we visited. Not everybody was home uh, when we went, but anyway, we'll forward that on to the new property management and ownership um, just to reiterate that there are residents who are still interested in having a dialogue with the new ownership. Um, and I don't know if we mentioned that previously, but the ownership did change back in December. So um, the, the owners of the new owners have been Fairly easy to engage, but we want to keep them engaged. Um, uh, with regard to hiring, uh, that's that's an important thing to keep you all notified of. Um, so we're um, in the process of doing interviews. I've got interviews um, scheduled for this Friday and next Friday. Um, hopefully, we will be able to have a decision uh, early in March and have another staff person in the office, which would be absolutely wonderful. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, Jenny and Lily will stay on with us um, for, for a little while longer. Those are the two interns to help keep the things going. The, the minutes, uh, Jenny's always doing our minutes. So thanks to her. And Lily's been really incredible at entering all the case data, which is super time consuming. And so um, frees me up to, to, to do the interaction with all the people that come in and contact the office. So um, last uh, couple of things, just more housekeeping. Um, we're gonna switch over fully to the .gov emails starting March 1st, because I wanna start that when, um, when Erica begins as commissioner. And um, in, if anybody has a challenge, uh, Wolfgang, I think you mentioned you have a challenge of accessing the .gov email um, in certain situations at work. So, um, We'd like to sh make a full shift over just for FOIA purposes, but um, if anybody has a concern about that full shift, let me know. I'll send out an email notification ahead of time, but um, let me know. We can talk it through. You know, we can come up with plans to make sure you stay in the loop. Um, but the idea would be to remove all your personal personal emails, um, and then all commission business would be going to the .gov uh, email address that you have now. Um, additionally, and I think this may tie into what we talked about with the retreat, um, we may shift all of our collaborative document uh, work to OneDrive because the city owns the uh, OneDrive 365 account. And so all of those things that we either collaborate on with box.com or Google Drive or in other formats, we can shift completely to OneDrive. And so that makes FOIA very, very easy for the FOIA officer. If somebody requests any document that we're working on or whatever, or things you are collaborating on, um, the, the FOIA officer can go straight to that OneDrive and pull it off um, quickly. So. Um, anyway, those are things to come up. I mentioned that it's maybe relative to the retreat because um, OneDrive, I find it still confusing. <laughs> I still mess things up on it um, when I'm trying to do crafty things with it. Um, so we may request to see if we get a little bit of training for folks, a little bit of orientation on the features of OneDrive at the retreat, just so that we're, we're not all in the dark in terms of how to use it. So um, I'll leave that uh, as my update. And uh, again, any questions, just uh, either ask now or, or excuse me, follow up with me um, uh, after the meeting at any point. Yeah, thank you, Todd and Mary. I was out sick. And so as you guys were volunteering for Mid Mid uh, Midway Manor, I really appreciate the, the level of outreach and just the community and getting the, the flyer out. Um, I don't think we have any ad hoc committee updates, Todd. I don't believe so. We had no ad hoc committee meetings. It's just a placeholder on the agenda in case some one of the chairs from the ad hoc committee wanted to bring something up. Mary, is there anything else you want to share about Midway Manor? I guess we'll get to it, but is there anything in the moment you want to share? Um, 
No, I, I mean, Todd did the, I think the bulk of the, the outreach there, um, but are, are we going to talk at all during this meeting about the hearing next week? Because I, I just want to remind particularly, you know, residents that we, we want to hear from them and kind of how that will work. But is that later in the agenda? This is later in the agenda. Okay, sounds that. good. Um, okay, so next is, um, sorry trying to view the actual document and not the, the list. So the next is the, um, the are we have to vote on this, Todd, the adoption for the rules and procedures for the Human Rights Commission? It's a chance for you to discuss the full, the full breadth of um, the amendments if you want to. I know you have, there's a lot of things on the agenda tonight. So if it's not a priority, you can table it. Um, but this is the document that I, I meant to share with you in the last agenda packet, but I, I I think I attached an earlier draft of it. This one has all the all the changes um, for you to consider um, with the Martha's rules, the the um, the getting rid of the standing committees and moving to ad hoc committees and various other additions. So it's up to you whether you feel prepared and, and want to spend the time on that this evening, but it's it's attached for you if you want to. Um, but it doesn't need action for us at the moment, Todd. Like, you may want to actually adopt um, those things, but um, yeah, I did put a, an asterisk on it for action in case you wanted more time to review and then discuss and amend. So, so are there any questions that the commission has? Do we anything you guys want to discuss about these changes? Okay. Yes, Wolfgang. Proposal 1A states that any proposal should always be in writing. And I think we've, unless we're, we're putting forward a formal resolution or amendment such as this, we don't tend to do that. So we might need to look this over and rewrite it for our normal workflow. Okay. So then we won't vote on it tonight. I think that's a good point, Wolfgang, that you may want to take a look at the Martha's rules because we, while we we sort of use them, we sort of don't. And if you want to modify them to, to more match what you're actually doing, that might be a good thing. So I think that that is one example. Okay, let's, Todd, can we pin this for next time so that people can review, we can make edits and- Sure thing, yep, no problem. This is This is always around, so no big deal. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm at the bottom of page 64. What's the next agenda item, Todd? I was with you. I'm, I'm scrolling real quickly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm out scroll I was just like, oh, page 64. Then I have to go. No worries. Yeah, it's it's a big thing. Um, so the next thing on the list is to talk about the housing panel. Um, so the thing that Mary was uh, talking about yeah. earlier. Yes, I'm so glad. I'm looking forward to this. And I want to announce, um, we know it within the commissioners and wanted to announce to the public um, that this will be February 22nd at 6 p.m. via Zoom. Um, please share far and wide um, information. We do want to hear from the public. And we have requested um, the mayor and city council to be there, but because of the holiday on Monday, they will be having their meeting. So they're not able to attend. And again, um, Ernest and I will be talking to um, Councilman Payne prior to the meeting. So if you have any comments, concerns, questions, if you're not able to attend the meeting, please, the public, let us know. We want to hear, hear from you. So Mary, I'll turn over to you. Yeah, the, the only other thing I would mention is that um, when we were doing outreach, we heard from a number of folks at Midway Manor that they didn't have a computer or weren't sure kind of how to access a Zoom link. And so we are working on seeing if we get some volunteers to be at Midway Manor with a computer, uh, a laptop, so people can, to, to, so that they can help uh, people share their, um, their thoughts. We particularly wanna hear from residents of um, public and subsidized housing about um, you know, issues uh, that you see. Is there a common room where we could project it on the screen? I was thinking the same thing, 
Jeanette, I was going to suggest they do actually have a television down there that they could probably tune into the, the station where it will be aired. And if we could provide them with the phone number, perhaps they can actually call into the Zoom meeting. But, but Mary, you may have had a comment about that as well. No, no, I think that's a great idea, actually, because that room had been opened up. Um, as I know, the first time we went, it was shut down. But it, it's, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Mary, so, Mary, so do you have the volunteers that you need? Um, um, I'll, I'll need to do it virtually, but do you, do you have what you need? I, um, I'm i going to talk to um, LAJC. They had mentioned, you know, have, perhaps having some staff. Um, and since uh, both LAJC and FAR have been kind of helping to coordinate this, I'll, I'll be in touch and, um, and make sure that we have somebody at least over there. Okay. Please let me know if you need anything and the agenda is pub, uh, published for that i mean the published posted um for that so again the, the the big part of this is going to be hearing um from from the residents and other community members concerns hey, i have a question though so if this is going on at the same time as city council then we're going to have an issue with this being broadcast because city council will probably take precedent over us. Yeah, you know, this is, um, you know, I worked, uh, I, I took our cue from far about the date, but it just didn't even occur to me that it would be a city council night. That's really problematic. I'm, I am yeah, concerned and, yeah, about they, that. Yeah, oh, no, it's, I mean, I, yeah, I, I get it because, you know, they switched it over because of President's Day. And that type of thing. So it 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 seemed like it's the perfect storm of everything happening at one time. We you know we definitely had um, a good idea on trying to do that. So you know my other concern is going to be about what do we do, you know, um, in getting those individuals who may come over and help uh, from far or LSE to be able to. Um, help them see the um the the town hall so that, that and if we did a projector and screen then it wouldn't we have the zoom link and so you can just project it onto the screen i mean you wouldn't do it through the tv but you just need a projector and screen and okay, we have well, that available too from the office if you want to use the projector and screen in the office um happy to help out with that um so okay so that's a lot of coordinating we got to get done in a short amount of time to get that to them to do. So, um, cause I don't want to not do it, but we, you know, I, I just know that's, that's a lot to get done. Um, well, to make is there, I, I mean, it, I'm assuming we should proceed. Is there, are there folks who think we should actually put it off? Oh no, I'm, I'm okay. definitely not saying put it off. Oh, definitely not, definitely not. Cause I, I'm the one that believes in if it's put on the calendar, we say we're going to do it, let's do it. Um, you know, we just have to be more careful about calendar the next time. But th let's go for it and make it happen. Because um, we, we got to do it. So let's do it. Let's hear from the public and go. And, um, you know, and this, is only be, this is only the start of what we're going to try to do to help with the public and letting the public know that we're listening to them. Right. I wanted to echo that, that it's the start. To, uh, Ernest, when you mean a lot to do, like uh, Todd, is, are you comfortable with getting that projector and screen there? Is that a lot for you to do and set up? Um, well, I will be on the meeting um, with you all. So I, I can't be doing that, but in, in the days leading up to it, I'm happy to coordinate with, um, who, you know, I think we've been talking mostly with Victoria and, and um, one of the law students who's been helping with outreach and others. Um, so if they if they have connection with um, maybe somebody who who can be a, at Midway Manor with folks, then I can get all the equipment to them and we can test it out in advance. I think. Um, but yeah, just Mary and I, maybe we can just chat um, following the meeting to sort of coordinate. But happy to do that. They've been pretty responsive. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Wolfgang, and all those that are working on this so diligently really appreciate it yes, especially when i was out a lot going on when i was out so i appreciate you guys pushing it forward yes Ernest.
you know, I, I was I was just agreeing with you and saying thank you to Mary and Wilkin for working that out and getting it together. Thank you. Um, so we will have our town hall that um, the ad hoc community engagement we discussed and I saw that like the polls went out to, for at thank you Todd and 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 Wendell for putting that out there. Um, it seems like we got a good response. Do you have any updates about the poll responses since then, Todd? Yeah, I was just trying to open it up with all my mini screens open to see if I could tell you what the current numbers are. I if I may fail because this 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 will show my OneDrive deficiencies here. But um, uh, if you keep talking, um, I can uh, I can look at it while <laughs> while you're moving forward, and I'll let you know what the numbers are. Yeah, so I think when you sent it, it was like maybe 17 responses. And I think the biggest was housing was the concern, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but yes. you know, yeah, this poll um, is out and they have until the end of this month, right, Todd, to complete this? Yes. And we actually, and maybe you saw that on your calendar, we actually have an opportunity next week, Thursday evening, I believe, to be on TV talking about this um, town hall meeting. If if you want to, we can. I I did not see that, Todd. Thank you. Okay. For... Yep. Mm -hmm. I said I had to set it up when I could because um, it was like one of the last slots. So it's on the twenty fourth. So, um, hey, <laughs> I'm notifying you now. Um, so yeah, Lachine set that up for us. But if it works, it works. If it doesn't, we can reschedule. But um, it's an opportunity to do one last bit of outreach. Um, like four days before the poll closes, if we need to, we can take a look and see what the numbers are. Okay, let's, we touch base tomorrow, right? So, or soon, or soon so let's touch base on that. Um, okay, um, is there any questions about the town hall? It, we did set the date for March 24th at 6.30 p.m. Any questions, comments, concerns? And again, we'll base, focusing on that meeting based on what the public says. So maybe what that looks like and maybe invited speakers will be to be determined based on the poll results. Any questions about that? Yes, Jeanette. To, oh, sorry. I just wondered if it was gonna be a limited time or if it was gonna be an open meet, like are we gonna limit the um, comment and response or are we just gonna have it be open depending on how many people attend? For, I mean, uh, well, go ahead, Jessica. You go, you I was going to say, we initially talked about like many things. I think I was initially envisioning this where we could have an opportunity to do breakout rooms. I don't know, Todd, from communications, if that's possible. So I want to wait to what it will look like. I'd hope for a lot to be open to com communication. If we can't do breakout rooms, we'll have to think about that, Jeanette. But I initially wanted to do breakout rooms. We could have smaller, intimate conversations. But again, we're I'm not sure the limitations of what communication is able to help us support that during that day. Jessica, I'm, and I don't know the complications of having breakout rooms and then suddenly things not being in the public view anymore, because if you do breakout rooms, people will disappear. Um, so I think that might not be possible. But if you ponder on it and tell me kind of what you'd like to see it, how you'd like to see it structured, I can certainly bring those things back to communications and then give you some answers. Um, and, and also while I'm jabbering, uh, we have 124 responses to the poll. Um, emergency housing access uh, still seems to be the primary topic um, I don't know, with 49 of those responses. And the second being um, the quality of affordable uh, public and subsidized housing, which is what we're already having sort of a town hall about next week. So um, we're maybe on the right track. And it's actually the thing that folks wanted to talk about um, at the second meeting was uh, the quality of affordable and public and subsidized housing. So there you have that. Awesome. That's really well, good news. Um, I was just wondering, Todd, if there's any, um, any plans that have been made about virtual versus in-person meetings? Are we just kind of virtual still, you know, for yeah. the for the time being and that I mean which is fine I'm just I just in terms of planning whether any meetings are going to start to be in person just curious yeah that's a great question and I think there was some talk about moving to in person in March uh, but that was a that was an update probably about a month or so ago 
Um, and so I don't know, that was, I think we had a big sort of like COVID protocol citywide meeting about that. Um, but I don't, I haven't heard any updates um, since then. So um, I'll find out, I'll, you'll be the first to know if we're meeting in person, I will let you know instantly because that'll, we'll have to make some, some big shifts and things. And I, I do think that there's still some option for hybrid meetings, but um, again, we wanna check all that out with communications, make sure their capacity is, is good for that. But we would be um, hopefully meeting in city space again when, when we are in person, which has been updated in terms of its gear. So uh, it's very easy to do hybrid um, and, and broadcast meetings from there now. Catherine. Yeah, I just had a quick question about the breakout room issue. And, and Todd, you said that because it's a public meeting, we not might not be able to, but the Human Rights Commission ran, well, I guess maybe it's the other way around, but there were public meetings that led to the Human Rights Commission. And I know there were small breakout work sessions and things like that in those meetings. So I feel like it ought to be legal, you know? What I'm saying, it's maybe tell tell me maybe clarify a little bit what you mean because I give me an example and I'll, I'll um well like like it. the dialogues on race right they were small group meetings and people brainstormed um, they 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 broke up into groups and went different ways and brainstormed and all of that wasn't publicly viewable and captured in minutes in necessarily in the same way like this meeting is. So I, I feel like we ought to be able for a town hall where the purpose is to solicit feedback, be able to break out into rooms and then come back and report out or something. I don't know. No, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah. like, just to kind of think about the, the different contexts. So the dialogue on race was, for those who, who weren't around for that, that was a, a, a long series of meetings over multiple years mm -hmm. in which um, members of the community came together and, and had dialogue, a dialogue about race, they then broke up into task force. And one of the task force was actually the result, the result of that, their work was the formation of the Human Rights Commission. The difference there is that those weren't public, or publicly appointed bodies, right? Those were just groups of community members getting together with some, some leadership. Um, and so I think that's the difference is that when the commission as a publicly appointed body um, has a meeting in which more than two commissioners attend, um, you have to, it has to be both publicly noticed and publicly accessible. Um, the limits to that, like, I, you know, it'd be sort of like entering into closed session when you, um, when you disappear. Um, and and the, by which I mean, those who are accessing it virtually perhaps um, can't, can't attend. Now, if it were only in person and the breakout groups sort of divided, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. But people, people then have the ability to attend. Yeah. Um, so that's, there's, there's a different access yeah. point right now. The only access is virtual. And so that's where I, I, I mostly just raise the question. I'm mostly speculating why, yeah. hmm, yeah. would that be a problem? So I think it's a, it's a great question to raise and we need just to. Todd, I'm going to invoke by Lindell and like, let's just try, like, I, I want to know more is the capability possible and then we can figure out like the, the, Cool. Like, I wouldn't say we all go away. I think there would be still a live session where they're having discussion, but there's still an opportunity to break out rooms and come back and report. It wouldn't mean we're all gone off screen. We would have a like probably a main discussion here, but I, I want to know more, more of it is capable. I'm invoking my Lindale hat. It's like, let's try it and yeah. then see what the limitations are. We're doing the best that yeah. we can, Todd, in, in this situation, in this in this and we're trying to open up a space and zoom is the only space that we have and if we did it in person we would be breaking out individual rooms um yeah but again let me know exactly like tell me what you want and i'll ask for it yeah okay i won't break out rooms based on the number of people that are coming like an equal amount so if 100 people come trying to break out you know 12 to 15 people per that number of breakout rooms is is reasonable and easy to have dialogue. But we can talk more about the what I'm saying, and maybe I can you know give more details. Are there any um, any more discussion about that? Okay, to the next item. I'm trying to catch up, Kumar. Um, so. 
the next is the annual retreat in, in Ernest and Todd and I were talking about this. I was on the verge of being really sick and I cannot find um, my notes. I would like to just say like, given time and opportunity, I'll start drafting and putting something together um, for us. I, some of what we talked about or I, what I would like to do is just talking about procedures and on, like onboarding and of course, deciding like what we're focusing on for this commission and potentially having a component of training, like maybe bringing in Holler back to do um, training with us. So I'm sorry, I don't have all the notes, but um, get, give me um, time. Definitely before our next meeting, I'll have something to present to you guys about my thoughts for the retreat. And again, I will open up if you guys have specific things that you like to bring up, please do not hesitate to email me. Ernest, anything you want to share specifically? And Ernest threatened me that this is birthday weekend and we need to give him some cake. So <laughs> virtual. <laughs> if, if you're virtual. I mean, we can if, still if, sing if, for if, you. If, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, I want, yes, I want song, I want music. Thank you very much. Yes, the song would be nice. Um, I know we want to, to kind of wait until after the town hall to really yes, thank um, knock down specifically some of the, the, the stuff um, geared toward some initiatives we want to push um, for the rest of the year. Uh, so we want to find out you know, how the town hall went um, and what we found with that to really kind of push um, what we really want to nail down and, and, and push within uh, what we want to fight for as doing that time. Um, I'm sorry, Catherine, I know we, we saw the email. So, um, you know, we'll try, like I said, we'll try to get you as much, as much information as we can uh, before then. So you can speak about, you know, your concerns um, during that time. So we can make sure we have your voice because we want to make sure we have everyone's voice um, heard and um, during that time that we are retreating. Okay, so are that any, was yeah. yeah. Are there, thank you for that. Are there any other um, concerns about that date? Are we all generally available that date and time? Okay, all right. Yay, I had like two minutes to spare. Public comment, woohoo! <laughs> okay, we're gonna open up to public comment. Um, I know Angie initially had your hand raised and I don't know if Richard, you have any further questions. Yes, Angie. Todd, can you give her permission, please? And you have the floor. Oh, thank you. Um, I do have a few questions um, regarding ACRJ. Um, I would like to know what, what is the number of people at ACRJ who qualify for HEI but have not been released? Um, so I have three questions. Um, then can you provide a breakdown of charges by percentage of those who are currently detained at ACRJ? And then can you also provide the exact number of those on the women's section of the jail? Um, so I, the number, the amount of folks who are in there um, who identify as women um, and the number of them who tested positive for COVID. And um, I did know that you all did mention um, about Midway Manor and their elevator not working. Um, and um, it's been a concern. I believe it was brought up um, at city council, um, but the estimated uh, maintenance date is somewhere in March. Um, and that is a problem. Um, and people have been contacting the fire department and um, all of those things. So um, just uh, amplifying that request again for folks to check in on that um, because that is a, a great concern for people uh, there. Um, and that's all. Richard, can, can you wait? Sorry. Um, calling from, yeah. Um, Richard, can you please? Or Todd, can you please? So Richard can speak. Thank you. He's got the floor. Hey, y'all. Thanks uh, again. And, uh, um, I didn't know uh, Sergeant uh, Coomer was going to be on, so I feel, feel like I nailed the timing on this. This is uh, this is great. It was very uh, grateful to hear uh, y'all's conversation 
Um, one thing to clarify is, is he did, um, I wasn't trying to say that chaplains weren't um, at the jail or at the ARCG, but uh, the, that um, from what I've heard is that they're, they're just stretched really thin because there's no group meetings. And yeah, some of the group activities that he talked about is, is limited. And so their ability to check in with each person is limited. So at least from the families I've, I've spoken with, it's, um, yeah, their, their loved ones and uh, the, the young men that I've worked with, they, they're just not getting a lot of human contact. And I will say too, as he mentioned, the, 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 the tablets and the way to connect with that has, is appreciated. And I think that's something to continue beyond this. Um, but I think there's something really important for uh, regarding human contact. And, and I don't know, it, it seems like in America, around the world, like there's just, you know, I feel like everybody has to say this, you know, I'm vaccinated. I think it's a good idea, but there's people who don't. And I think we, we've got to figure out how to learn to live um, together in a world where some people make that decision. And so, again, I just want to encourage uh, um, Sergeant and, and everyone here just to, to look for ways for the, the inmates to have human contact with their family and with one another, to have the activities that re, re, do work towards rehabilitation and bring some of that dignity and self-worth um, back to them, um, especially as uh, as it's been a long time, um, especially for those who are, who are there for longer than that average period of time. So thanks again for, uh, for the conversation and for you know, the work y'all are doing and uh, you know, just for offering for continuing this conversation beyond this point tonight. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Yes, Colonel Kumar, please respond. Oh, sure. Richard, uh, thank you very much for, for clarifying that. And if everybody, it has a pen and paper handy. I won't give you my, my cell phone number if that's appropriate, if y'all don't mind. Just, I mean, just to make you aware, this does go public and oh. it's recorded. So, my cell phone number is in the public. It's on all okay. of my emails that go out. I just encourage you know. family, friends, ex inmates once they're released to give me a call if I can help them or have any questions. I've found that getting those calls at 10 o'clock at night, a quick five minute phone call will save me two hours the next morning. So, I don't mind whatsoever. Uh, my cell phone number is 434-962-3015. And I encourage any family member who has any questions, any community has any concerns, call me, invite me to coffee. I'll even pay for it. Just let's have a conversation. Let's work together. We can make that jail a, 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 uh, uh, a benefit. I don't know a better way to say it, but, uh, a part of this community that um, is helpful, not hurtful to the degree possible. So anyway, um, Richard, again, thank you very much. And I agree with you. We do, we are starting programming back up now as we speak. Uh, the, anytime we have an outbreak, it really slows things down, but we do have some programming going back on again now. So we have our own internal facilitators who provide programming. So we're starting to get that going again. Uh, to the, the first lady, and I apologize, I did not catch your name. Um, ACRJ, the number of people who um, are currently in jail, who could be on home electronic incarceration, but are not. As of today, Thursday, there is zero. Um, there's nobody in the jail as of today whose charges or sentence or otherwise makes them eligible for home electronic incarceration and they are not on HEI. And we review the, the population frequently to make sure that happens. In addition, it also happens at the time of sentencing and at the time of bond hearings. They're reviewed for eligibility by the courts. So once someone is sentenced and they're not placed on HEI by the judge, the Commonwealth attorney myself can also have that conversation and we can make that decision together. And I wanna put a plug in here for Joe Platania and Jim Hensley, uh, city and county Commonwealth uh, attorneys. Without them, uh, the outbreaks we have had would have been a lot worse over the last two years. If they hadn't worked so hard and their members of their office and our public defenders and our judges have not worked so hard to get as many people out of the jail as they have and to keep as many people out of the jail they have. And most importantly, in a safe manner. I wanna make, I wanna stress that. Everyone who goes out in HEI, we do so after they're reviewed in a very, very safe manner. We've been very fortunate. We have over 500 people on HEI over the last two years. 
And you had another question about um, percentage of charge types, I believe. I think you were, and if I'm wrong, please let me know. You were asking about um, the people who are in jail, what are the percentage of charge types, like number of people that are on drug distribution or DUIs and so forth. I don't have the information handy, but I can get that and provide it. I don't know what manner I should send that to, perhaps the um, chair um, to get that out. I'm happy to do that. And the number of, I believe, women who have contracted the virus since they've been in jail, I don't have that. And I don't know how readily available that is, but I, it's something I can work on. And I'm happy to try and get that back out here to um, this committee if, if that's acceptable. And I think somebody else had a question about that too on the committee. So obviously that's an important question. I think Andrew, you may have had that question, I don't know. Uh, yep. And uh, so let me see if I can put something together, some statistics for you. I can break down by sex, race. Um, yeah, and I can get it out to you as quickly as I can as if, if we have that data relatively readily available, or I can at least give you a percentage of snapshot of, of a good indication, so. And does that answer your question? I'm sorry, I was trying to figure out how to unmute. Um, yeah, so I wanted the, the, so the question was the number of uh, women who are currently at ACRJ and then the number of positive COVID results for that specific demographic, um, not a combined, um, because it seems like in this conversation, um, it was focused on the men's side which has a, the highest number of folks, right? But also it's disregarding the uh, women who are incarcerated at ACRJ. Um, so I would be interested in that. And I believe the Human Rights Commission would also. Thank you. Oh, just, just to be clear, the numbers I gave tonight did include both men and women. Um, I mentioned men a lot because they have a higher number, but not because you know, we think anything different of, of our uh, women who are incarcerated. So those numbers include both men and women. And I think right now um, we have inside the jail about 30 women, give or take, changes by the hour, literally, but about 30 women are inside the jail. But I'll be happy to um, see if I can work up some numbers and get it out to the commission. And again, I, I apologize, I just have like 10 seconds. I do want to, I, I want to work with the commission. Um, somebody asked earlier, you know, who's the decision makers, who's in power, who can make changes. Again, I'm not the ultimate power authority. I don't want to portray that. However, I am in charge of the jail. It's my responsibility to make sure that I work with the community and kind of engage with the community so we can come to some type of resolution as to how your jail, not mine, it's the taxpayer's jail is run and operated. So I want to work with the commission so I don't know who that contact person would be, but I would love to develop that, that relationship, sit down and have some coffee and figure out a way we can um, kick this off and, and have a good working relationship so we can, we can um, initiate change that's better for everybody. Um, I do wanna eventually give public comment, but I just wanna say um, to you, uh, Colonel Kumar, I'd, I'd love to sit down and coffee with you. I love coffee. Um, thank you. This is positive. I think something within our commission personally is we want to bring change. Um, our commission through the guy I just started chair um, last uh, last time, but Mary <laughs> and Len and Catherine were previous um, chair and vice chair, and they really we really were pushed into like action. Like we're tired of like talking about it, and we're wanting to do action. And so I am personally encouraged by you being here and making offer it and available. It's sometimes hardest like what I've learned in communication and in being an outreach, sometimes it's just the unknown. Well, we don't know. That's why I asked the, you know, how comfortable are your inmates to ask you questions? You seem very like open and honest, but there's like a fear factor, you know, like that they're having. And so wanting to dress this, I'd love to continue the conversation. I really appreciate you being on here with this for as long as you have to wait to final comment. I appreciate you asking questions and he has an information and once he gives it to us, um, uh, if there's ways, you, our our email address is on there. You could email our commission, and um, 
we can have that. So I just want to say personally um, that I would love to connect with you and thank you so much for your time. Like I learned a lot today and there was Lindell who was saying like, who has the power? And I would love <laughs> to work with you about what does that look like? Because we really truly make change in our community. It's a real question. I love that about Lindell. Like she's always asking like that straight up, like how can we make change in our community? And so I feel encouraged um, by you just being here and being open. Like you jumped on you know, just two days ago, willing to offer. Um, so I, I personally appreciate it. Um, I will stop talking and ask the commission if you have any um, um, response to the matters by the public. I, I wanted to follow up um, with Ms. Khan's comment about the elevators at Midway Manor and the, you know, it's just an issue that we heard about a lot. And, and I, I just want to emphasize that this is not just like a theoretical inconvenience. Midway Manor is a building built and subsidized for elderly and disabled folks. So the people we were talking to literally can't leave their homes when the elevator's out. So we talked to a gentleman who had, had to cancel a necessary medical appointment. People can't leave, they can't go to the grocery store, they can't do basic things. It's really, really uh, a, a profound matter of community concern. Um, and I know that was it, you know, sort of implicit, but I, I wanted to just say that explicitly. So I am, I am really hopeful that um, the folks, uh, residents of Midway Manor and other folks will, will join us next week for the hearing. Thank you, Ryan, for that. Andrew, Andy. So quick question about the elevator. Is it, cause there are two elevators. Is it one that's not operational or is it both of them? Right, right now, I think one is working, um, but there have been mm -hmm. a, a number of times when both were out um, right. and uh, and that sometimes went on for, you know, for quite a bit of time. Okay. Any other comments? Thanks again, Anne, for um, your comments and speaking up, and Richard also for speaking up. And Molly's on. How did I miss that? We see you, Molly. <laughs> Thanks for being here with us tonight. Um, so are there any commissioner updates? I am so glad, like we are we are making stuff happen. Um, all right, so I would like to call this meeting if there are no other comments, concerns, or burning questions at 8.14 p.m. Thank you guys. See you Thank next you week. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks everyone. Good night.